I think scoring systems and other clinical decision support tools may be valuable to the dermatologist, but I also think the ultimate appropriateness of the decisions reached by these tools must be made by the physician and patient in the context of each unique clinical situation. Um, in short, the art of medicine is equally important. That's Dr. Julie Crowley, and this is Dermatology Weekly, the weekly podcast from MD Edge Dermatology. I'm MD Edge editor Elizabeth Meshkati. And I'm MD Edge editor Terry Rudd. Today, how can you integrate decision making resources into your clinical practice? In this resident takeover of the podcast, three dermatology residents, Dr. Daniel Mazzori, Dr. Elizabeth Tracy, and Dr. Judy Crowley, discuss clinical decision support tools such as scoring systems and other resources available for dermatologists. In the news, there's new safety data from the EADV Congress for tacrolimus in children with atopic dermatitis, as well as phase three study results for an interleukin 17A inhibitor in children and adolescents with psoriasis. And the National Academy of Medicine releases a report on addressing clinician burnout. You can reach Dermatology Weekly by emailing us at podcasts at mdedge.com. You'll also find that email address in the podcast description. And now the news. There was no hint of increased cancer risk with up to 10 years of topical tacrolimus use in children with atopic dermatitis. That's the takeaway message from the large prospective Apple study. That finding, paired with similar data on pimacrolimus, has raised the question about whether it's time to modify the warnings about cancer fears when using topically applied calcineurin inhibitors. The box warnings have been a source of enormous frustration for dermatologists and other clinicians. The warnings were added to the labeling in the United States and Europe in 2005, based on concern about an increased risk of malignancy in organ transplant recipients on systemic calcineurin inhibitors for immunosuppression. That's despite the fact that, unlike the systemic versions, the topical agents are used intermittently, their systemic absorption is low to nil, and no plausible mechanism by which they could cause cancer has been described. Dr. Regina Folster-Holst is professor of dermatology at Christian Albrecht's University in Kiel, Germany. She presented the Apple study data at the annual congress of the European Academy of Dermatology and Venereology. Apples included nearly 8,000 children with moderate or severe atopic dermatitis. Their median age at enrollment was six years. With nearly 45,000 person years of follow-up, there were no lymphomas and just a single case of skin cancer. Those two types of malignancies were singled out in the boxed warnings for topical tacrolimus and pimacrolimus as being of particular concern. A total of six cancers were diagnosed in six patients during the nearly 45,000 person years of prospective follow-up. None of these malignancies is classically associated with immunosuppressive therapy. In another pediatric study presented at the EADV Congress, ixekizumab met all primary and secondary endpoints in a phase three trial of six to 18 year olds with moderate to severe plaque psoriasis. The interleukin 17A inhibitor is approved for treating psoriasis in adults, but the only biologic currently approved for pediatric psoriasis in the United States is the TNF inhibitor, Etanercept. The 12-week double-blind multicenter Exora PEDS trial enrolled 115 pediatric psoriasis patients randomized to weight-based ixekizumab, weight-based Etanercept, or placebo. At the 12-week mark, everyone was switched to open-label ixekizumab in a long-term extension study. One of the primary endpoints was the proportion of patients achieving a static physician's global assessment score of 0 or 1, that is, clear or almost clear skin, at week 12. At that time, 81% of those on ixekizumab had a score of 0 or 1, compared with 40% on etanercept and 11% on placebo. The other primary endpoint was the POSI 75 response rate at 12 weeks, which was achieved by 89% of those on ixekizumab, 63% on etanercept, and 25% on placebo. Dr. Kim Papp, who presented the results, is a dermatologist and president of Probity Medical Research in Waterloo, Ontario. 
Dr. Pop says the POSI 90 results were more revealing. 78% of those on the IL-17A inhibitor achieved a POSI 90 at 12 weeks, compared with 40% on etanercep and 5% on placebo. He described the combined safety data for the pediatric double-blind phase and the open-label extension as essentially the same as the adult experience. Almost 20% of pediatric patients on ixekizumab had injection site reactions, but those reactions were generally mild and resulted in few, if any, treatment discontinuations. There was a 2% incidence of Crohn's disease, and candidiasis and other infections were rare. Medicine needs a major reset to address the stresses that lead to clinician burnout. That's according to a report from an influential federal panel. The National Academy of Medicine released a report titled Taking Action Against Clinician Burnout, a Systems Approach to Professional Well-Being. The report calls for a broad and unified approach to tackling the root causes of burnout. Dr. Pascal Karyan of the University of Wisconsin co-chairs the NAM committee that produced the report. During a press briefing, she said there must be a concerted effort by leaders across healthcare to create less stressful workplaces for clinicians. The report outlines an approach that has six goals. The first goal, create a positive workplace. The second, address burnout in training and in the early years of being an attending. The third goal, reduce administrative burden. The report's final three goals are to improve health information technology's usability and relevance, reduce stigma and improve burnout recovery services, and create a national research agenda on clinician well-being. Previous research has found that between 35% and 45% of nurses and physicians in the U.S. have substantial symptoms of burnout. Burnout rates among medical students and residents range from 45% to 60%. We'll be right back after this message. And now, Dr. Daniel Mazzori, Dr. Elizabeth Tracy, and Dr. Judy Crowley. Clinical decision support tools are becoming increasingly popular in dermatology. These tools can be used at the bedside, often through a free smartphone app to help guide clinical decision making regarding diagnosis, prognosis, and management. As with any medical instrument, these tools have limitations. My name is Dan Mazzori, and I'm a third-year dermatology resident at SUNY Downstate in Brooklyn. Today, I'll be talking about clinical decision support tools that are practical for dermatology residents, along with my fellow CUTIS resident corner columnist. Hi, I'm Libby Tracy. I'm a third-year resident at the Cleveland Clinic. Thank you for having me. And I'm Julie Crowley. I'm a third-year dermatology resident at the University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston, Texas. Thanks for joining me, guys. So before we dive into specific clinical decision support tools, I wanted to start us off with a general question, and that is what you guys think about the use of these tools in dermatology. I think scoring systems and other clinical decision support tools may be valuable to the dermatologist. Um, But I also think the ultimate appropriateness of the decisions reached by these tools must be made by the physician and patient in the context of each unique clinical situation. Um, In short, the art of medicine is equally important. With that said, I do use a couple of scoring systems on a regular basis. I would agree with Julie. I think they're most helpful to me in standardizing and interpreting literature and research, and I think that they're less helpful in clinical practice, at least the way that I've been trained. We focus more or lean more on clinical judgment. I agree with you guys. I think certainly historically speaking, these types of instruments um, when it comes to dermatology were used more in the research space. Um, I think they're becoming more and more useful in the clinical space these days, but of utmost importance is the art of medicine. I think in my experience, and the reason why I chose to tackle this subject for my column is because I found it pretty helpful to integrate these tools with my practice. Um, So something that I use almost daily is a tool called the PEST. Um, It's a quick five-question tool that can help screen for psoriatic arthritis. And it's the kind of thing that I'll, I'll use in addition to asking a patient with psoriasis questions about symptoms like 
joint pain and morning stiffness. So it's you know the, the integration of that tool with the art of medicine that I think um, ultimately is what comes together when my attending and I make a decision about whether or not that patient should see rheumatology. But of course, clinical judgment is first line, and the tool isn't something to substitute for that, but something to supplement it. So along those lines, I wanted to ask you about some of the clinical decision support tools that you guys use in clinic. I use UpToDate on a regular basis for clinical decision support. For example, the other day I had a patient who we diagnosed with scabies, and we were counseling the patient on how to decontaminate their environment, and I wanted to get the exact number of hours there belongings needed to be in a plastic bag or how to wash their clothes. So we went up to date and kind of read it together in the clinic. Um, We actually also consulted the CDC website in that encounter. I use Lexicomp for dosing guidelines on a regular basis. And and then for more dermatology-specific conditions, if there's something obscure like a histiocytosis or one of the more rare blistering disorders, I'll reference um, one of our textbooks, like Bologna's Dermatology, online. I look at the Scabies article on UpToDate a lot, too. So I think that's probably something that a lot of dermatology residents um, have used often. In addition to that article on UpToDate, I tend to use a lot of the algorithms that UpToDate offers. There's one that walks you through how to interpret syphilis test results, which sometimes can be confusing, especially when they're seemingly discordant. And beyond up to date, I also have the Visual DX app on my phone. And depending on the case, um, I think it's nice to be able to use that app to help build a differential diagnosis. Again, not as a primary tool, but as one to make sure that I haven't overlooked anything before I go ahead and present to my attending. I also find it helpful to use tools for formulating differential diagnoses. I like up to date, Bologna. Google Scholar, even on my smartphone for a quick scan of good review articles. I actually had a patient the other day in my resident clinic with chelitis, and I found it helpful to expand my differential with up to date. While more common etiologies came to mind, I was able to broaden the differential, um, and that guided further workup and management. The nice thing about resources like up to date and visual DX2 is that they have patient resources. So you can print out a handout that is supposed to be something that you know, a patient can understand without too much medical background. And I found those handouts to be helpful as kind of an adjunct to what these tools are, I think, primarily intended to be used for. I find that tool particularly helpful as well. Yeah, they're very comprehensive and they're a nice resource for patients. When it comes to inpatient consults, are there any clinical decision support tools that you guys have used and found helpful or not helpful? On the consult service, I found the SCORE 10 scoring system valuable in evaluating patients with TEN. I often felt that the primary team wanted this information and that it was a helpful tool to have. Yeah, I found it useful in that sense too as a measure of risk to communicate to the primary team, even the patient's family, if, you know, they're asking about prognosis. But as I mentioned earlier, as with any tool, the score 10 isn't perfect. There are studies that have found that it can overestimate or underestimate mortality. So it's helpful, but it's not the end-all, be-all. And depending on where you practice, if you don't have a burn unit at your institution and you're trying to transfer your patient to one, Um, you may need to calculate the score 10 and report it to the burn unit that you're talking to in order to, um, you know, as as a part of your presentation to try to get the patient transferred. And I think that touches on the theme that I see a lot in my practice is that scoring systems often are more useful in a logistical manner for getting insurance coverage or transferring a patient to another center and um, not necessarily to change our clinical judgment, but to justify our treatment decisions. Yeah, I think that's pretty interesting, and I'm not sure why, but it's sort of a difference between dermatology and other specialties. I remember in medical school and as an intern in internal medicine, 
these types of clinical decision tools were all the rage. And I would be on MDCalc all the time calculating someone's like risk for DVT-PE or a myriad of other different things. Whereas in dermatology, I think it's something that's becoming more and more practical and utilized, but it still hasn't caught up in the same way that it really has taken off in internal medicine and emergency medicine, for example. But along the lines of being able to communicate with the primary team, I found another tool to be helpful, and that's the Alt-70 score. It's a four-variable score that helps differentiate cellulitis from pseudocellulitis. And um, it was intended to be primarily used by frontline practitioners, so primary care physicians or emergency physicians to decide whether or not they should treat for cellulitis or consult a dermatologist, for example. But as an offshoot of that, I found it helpful as a consultant um, in cases of presumed cellulitis because, again, like we've been talking about, it gives me an objective measure of risk to communicate to the primary team in support of one diagnosis or another, in addition to my clinical judgment. So it doesn't replace how uh, you know, I otherwise feel about the case, but it sort of allows me to say, you know, this patient has X percent chance of having cellulitis or Y percent chance of not. And I think that just kind of helps solidify clinical judgment, especially when talking to um, the primary team. That's so true. I think that the optimal treatment for patients in a complex medical system requires not just coming to the correct diagnosis and using your clinical judgment to make a decision, but effectively communicating that decision to the insurance companies, to the primary team that's taking care of them on the inpatient service, or communicating your recommendations back to the primary care provider. And I think that you're right, some objective data can really be useful in those situations. Yeah, so these scores almost end up being less useful in our decision making and more so as ways sort of like communication tools, you know, to try to get other services like on board with how we're feeling, for example. So we've talked about clinic in general and inpatient consults. How about dermatologic surgery? Are there any clinical decision support tools that you guys use when it comes to this area? When it comes to dermatologic surgery, I like the updated antibiotic prophylaxis algorithm as published by By Harbo et al. in dermatologic surgery and reprinted in Alicon's Review of Dermatology. I also use the MOSE appropriate use criteria for select tumors. In some instances, it does help guide my decision. I'm glad you brought up the MOSE AUC. Um, That's one of the tools that I wrote about in my column. And, you know, of all the tools that I wrote about in research, this was the one that I think, since its development, has received the most criticism in the literature. So I was wondering if you guys have any thoughts about that criticism and if that's influenced the way that you use it in your practice. I think the MOSE appropriate use criteria is a useful guideline, but it should be emphasized that the report's disclaimer states, the ultimate judgment of appropriateness must be made by the physician and patient in the context of the unique clinical situation. I think criticism that the MOSE appropriate use criteria have gotten in the literature highlight this disclaimer. It's been scrutinized for its classification of most primary superficial basal cell carcinomas as appropriate for treatment by MOSE. It's been scrutinized for the report's limitation that only publications from the United States are included, omitting several important European trials that Appropriate use criteria ratings are largely based upon expert opinion rather than evidence, um, which has also been uh, the source of criticism. Also meriting consideration, there are discrepancies in the appropriate use criteria. I report some of these in a letter to the editor published ahead of print in JAD. For example, a primary squamous cell carcinoma in situ greater than two centimeters in the L distribution in a healthy patient is categorized as appropriate, while the recurrent equivalent is categorized as uncertain, and there are no data in the literature to support these counterintuitive criteria. So while I think the MOSE 
appropriate use criteria provides a valuable tool to dermatologists. These recent criticisms allude to the need for future revision as new data becomes available and the current guidelines are reevaluated in the context of clinical practice. I think that's really important to bring up, and I think it, you know, sort of underscores the bottom line, which is that whether it's the MOSE AUC or any other clinical decision support tool, that tool should be used as a supplement, not a substitute for one's clinical judgment. I think the ideal situation is when your clinical judgment and whatever tool you use match up in terms of the outcome. But if your clinical judgment and the tool that you're using give a discordant result, then it's important to ultimately rely on your clinical judgment or, you know, perhaps take a step back and, you know, maybe use that as an opportunity to say, hey, maybe this tool is more correct than me and maybe I'm making a mistake somewhere and sort of, you know, be critical of yourself in that way. But at the end of the day, if you think a patient has psoriatic arthritis and their PEST score, for example, says they don't, and you're really convinced that they do and should see a rheumatologist, then you should refer them to one. You should not do it just because some tool told you that. It's unlikely that they don't have that diagnosis. And I think that brings up an important point in general that you should only perform a test, including a scoring tool. You should only perform a test if you think it's going to change your management. So, you know, if your pretest probability for, you know, having enough clinical suspicion of psoriatic arthritis to send your patient to rheumatology, if it's high enough that doing the scoring system isn't going to change your decision, then you can probably just skip it. So we've talked about scoring systems and clinical decision support tools when it comes to clinical practice. I'm wondering if you guys have used any of these tools outside of patient care. For me, I find scoring systems most useful in interpreting primary literature data, like the score ad system in atopic dermatitis, the POSI scores in psoriasis, the VOSI scores in vitiligo, et cetera. These are scoring systems I don't frequently use in the clinical setting, but I think they're very useful in combing through the primary literature and evaluating new treatment therapeutic options that are coming out. Yeah, those are scores I haven't had to calculate really myself in clinic, but I agree it's absolutely essential to understand what they mean because that's how a lot of our data on the therapies that we're using, you know, in terms of efficacy, that's the variable by which they're reported. And the other day, I actually, like, went through how you calculate the PASI, and, you know, it's it's very different than how I'm used to sort of evaluating a patient with psoriasis, and it's very onerous and cumbersome. So I think that there are certain tools like that that makes more sense in a research space, and then there's these other tools that we've been discussing that are really, you know, ones that are made to be used at the bedside, be calculated within a few seconds, you know, a few minutes. Um, And those are the ones that are more practical potentially to use if you feel like you have, like Libby was saying, a pretest probability that that would warrant one of these tools. I think it's important to know how to calculate these more research-based ones just in case or at least uh, know where to look them up and, and do it if you have to because I've heard that depending on where you practice, there are some insurances that actually require these scores for prior authorizations. So it's just something to keep in mind um, in case you're asked of it from an insurance company. And then aside from sort of clinical practice, there's another app slash algorithm that the AAD has put out. It's their MyGermPath app. And I found it really helpful just when it comes to studying GermPath because it lets you build a differential based on the histopathological pattern. And it's something that, you know, some of my residents will pull out whenever we're looking at unknowns and we're kind of stumped. But we've sort of whittled down the pattern um, just to kind of help us organize our thoughts. So on a final practical note, we've talked a lot about different tools that our listeners can can use in practice um, and outside of the clinic as well. But how do you guys actually access these tools and how can other people, if they're interested, I typically access these scoring tools on my smartphone, just what I have handy. A lot of these tools have, like um, we mentioned previously, 
specific apps that you can download. So I find that helpful. I also have some of the scoring tools saved in a separate folder, photograph folder in my phone. So anytime I find like a valuable chart or algorithm or tool, I'll just snap a photo of it in my smartphone and I'll just have a separate folder that I can easily access with all of these algorithms in them. The only specific application that I have on my phone is the Moe's AUC app, which I use pretty frequently. And for other scoring systems, I generally just use the website on the computer. And then there are some research studies at my institution that are going on right now that we enroll our patients in clinic in, and we use the scoring systems on paper. But for the most part, it would be on a website. Like you guys, most of the tools that I use are available through free um, smartphone apps. I think the only tools that we've mentioned that aren't are the SCORE 10 and then the antibiotic prophylaxis algorithm that Julie had mentioned. So you know, those I think would be areas where maybe you'd want to, you know, for example, take a screenshot or save a photo of that algorithm or SCORE so that you can access it pretty easily. But aside from that, all these other tools are available for free to be downloaded into apps. So that's sort of part of the way that they can be used really easily at the bedside. So that brings our conversation about clinical decision support tools in dermatology to an end. I'm Dan Mazzori, and on behalf of my fellow CUTIS resident corner columnist, thank you for listening, and join us next time for another episode of Resident Takeover. And that concludes this week's episode of Dermatology Weekly. To get past and future episodes of Dermatology Weekly, subscribe now on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Terry Rudd. For Dr. DeLeo, MD Edge editor Melissa Sears, and all of us here at MD Edge, I'm Elizabeth Mishkati. Thanks for listening.